Hello, folks. How you all? Uh, how you doing this morning? Good to uh, be with you all again in our, uh, our time of uh, Bible study, our prayer time, and also Bible study. Uh, we know that this is probably going to be uh, a way of life for us as the uh, as the church uh, progresses, as we move on, as we start having the conversations about, you know, in a sense, kind of the uh, a reopening phase, if you will. Uh, but we are grateful, very thankful to God just for just this opportunity uh, that God has, uh, has given us. You know, I keep saying that God is pretty smart. God knew these things were going to be happening to his church, and so he's done what was necessary to supply us with what we need uh, to be able still to, to do what? To communicate his truth. And that's what we hear, uh, as always, uh, Wednesday mornings. I was uh, talking to someone the other day, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think we've been doing this since 1993, I think this would be the 27th year that we've been doing morning and evening Bible study. Uh, and so, again, always a joy, a joy, part of the DNA of our church. And so I always encourage everyone uh, to, um, you can't do it at night, you do it in the morning. Uh, right now, we're uh, taking advantage of the live streaming. And uh, we're doing it one time in a day, but also there's an opportunity for us to watch it in the evenings uh, whenever that time prevents at, presents at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, I'm late this morning. Believe it or not, the reason I'm late is because I had to serve my granddaughter before I got to church. I just, I, it's about eight minutes that I'm here. I had to serve my granddaughter this morning. I say, oh, man, you must really be a grandfather that you know you got to go do Bible study. But here you are. Um, waiting on serving your granddaughter, because uh, she's at the house right now, serving your granddaughter, making yourself late to get to church. But I'm cool with it. I'm good with it. I mean, so I'm going to ask you to turn to Proverbs 27, just for our uh, beginning of our study today. Many of you have the handout. You got it in the email. And so go to Proverbs chapter 27, and we're going to unpack that just a little bit more from a practical standpoint today. But before we do that, we certainly want to be pray, praying for uh, Luanna Johnson. Luanna is dealing with some high blood pressure issues right now. Uh, currently um, in uh, Memorial Hermann Hospital in uh, the uh, Umble area. Uh, and of course, we know the limitations on visiting and the like. One family member can be there with her. Uh, but she's really struggling right now, so we want to pray for her that God will allow that to balance off and uh, where it doesn't consume her and uh, lead to other things. Uh, having said that, we are praising God for the recovery of Reverend Linton Jason, and I actually spoke with him this morning. Uh, wanted me to greet all of you uh, as far as the church is concerned in the name of Jesus. Again, he's grateful again for the prayers that we did pray, uh, and he's on the way to recovery. Thank God he had the stroke uh, on, on, uh, on last week. And, uh, but he went back home uh, on yesterday, and so we're grateful and thankful to God for his recovery. Many others that are uh, still just getting older and the, the issues that we're dealing with with life, and of course we do know the on is on ongoing issue with COVID-19, that all of us are still being infected and affected by, and so we want to lift everyone in prayer as it relates to that. So would you bow with me for just a moment as we, uh, as we go to God? Once again, Father, we are thankful and grateful to you for the blessing of life. Thank you, God, for choosing by your grace and by your power to allow us to wake up to a new day, to wake up to a new beginning, to wake up to a fresh start, to wake up to a day that we've never witnessed before and a day that when it is gone, it won't be exactly like this day. And so, God, we, we thank you. We thank you again for, for demonstrating again that you are God and we can look at the sky, we can look at the trees, the flowers, uh, we can smell the essence of life around us, whether it's the grass or the flowers that bloom. Uh, we are, again, witnessing the warmth of the weather. We can witness the cool of the A.C., and all of that, God, is a reflection of your glory. So, Father, it doesn't matter what position that we're in right now, whether we, where we are in this place, where we are in our homes, whether we're on our jobs, uh, whether we're in the hospital, whether we're in a nursing home, whether we're in the penitentiary, whether we're in jail. doesn't matter where we are, God. We clearly know that you still deserve the glory. You still deserve the honor. And you still deserve all the praise. So, God, we give it to you today. We say thank you for being so good, so kind. 
so loving, so generous, so caring, so mindful of the details of our lives uh, that you, uh, uh, you know the number of hairs on our head. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, just in and of itself, just to think about. So here we are today. We're grateful for life as it is. We're grateful for your grace that is uh, what we do not deserve. We're grateful for your mercy uh, that you continue to extend to us. Uh, we're grateful for our, your forgiveness because we know we've all sinned and come short of your glory. We know we've all done some things that have been contrary to your word, uh, said some things, thought some things. But God, you have uh, said to us, if we confess it, you are faithful and just to forgive it. And we thank you for that forgiveness. And we count on, we count on that forgiveness. And so we, we thank you for forgiving us even right now. And so, Lord, even as we pray this morning, we don't want to remember Luana and ask, Lord, for healing in her body. We know that her children have been praying for her, no doubt. But we just come alongside them, and we lift her before you and ask, Lord, that you would allow the blood pressure issue, even as she prays for herself, to level out. Help the doctors to determine what's really going on in her body, uh, what's happening physiologically with her. And then give her healing, God. Give them the diagnosis. Give them the proper prognosis for her as she moves forward. Thank you for Reverend Linton, Jason, God. And we've seen the proof again of your grace and protection and power, that uh, situation that could have gone a whole lot different than what it did. The blood clots that were there, the stents that had to be placed in. And to know that now he's home and recovering with his family. God, thank you so much for that awesome and re great reality. We pray for the Savannah family, the Wilson family. God, you know what they've been going through, the bereavement still recurring from the loss of Sister Betty Savannah, the burial on last Saturday. God, I just ask again for comfort as only you can give for every family that's in bereavement, uh, whether it's sickness like Betty had or whether it's the coronavirus issue that we're dealing with. And then, Lord, I pray for the family of uh, the young man in Minnesota who was, uh, we can say, brutally murdered by the police officers. God, I know you're a God of justice. I know you are. I know you see everything. I know you see every detail. But you tell us, don't fret because of evil. And so we're not fretting over. But God, we certainly ask that your justice would prevail. I ask that your justice would prevail. God, help those in authority to know that they are not above the law that they even swore to keep. And so I pray for that family that's going through a tough time now that's hurting. A loved one that they saw go through what he went through. So I just pray that you would give comfort and ease as only you're able to do, God, and allow uh, the investigations and everything that is being done, help it to be just, help it to be fair, uh, help it to be the right thing that is done uh, through it all. Uh, once again, for people all over the world, we lift them before you, the people of the Lot Carry Missions, we lift them before you all of the missionaries all over the world that are dealing with the issues that they have to deal with. We just lift them all before you and ask again, your continued grace and mercy be upon each and every one of us. For every member of the Good Shepherd Church, from Sister Phil, age 92, uh, to the baby that is yet in Tanisha's belly, we thank you for each and every one. We praise you for each and every one. We love you for each and every one. Help us to be the family of God that you would have us to be, not only for our church, but every church that is open in your name on the seven continents of this world. We, uh, we, we honor you for who you are. We praise you for who you, we, you are. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for the fact that you allow us to be called your children. Thank you so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, the study, uh, Proverbs 27. And we're going to jump right in because we do know that we're talking about God giving a man by the name of Solomon, the, uh, the word Solomon would be the word Shalom, who, uh, who literally becomes the, the, uh, the sage, uh, he becomes the preacher, he becomes the, uh, the one who God gives wisdom and insight to, uh, to the point that he is, uh, he is able to uh, bring words of wisdom, again, when we talk about wisdom, the word Sophia, uh, it's to live skillfully, to live life skillfully, uh, but to look at that from the standpoint of the objective truth of the word of God and looking at how God gives that opportunity for us to apply that truth on a daily basis. 
you ever thought about how many decisions you've made just this morning since you've awakened? Whatever time you woke up this morning, how many decisions you've had to make? And hopefully, those decisions that you've made are decisions that have lined up with the Word of God. Now, now in order for that to happen, first of all, in our case, you have to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And for those of us who know that, we know that we believe what the gospel, the, in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ the life that he lived, the anticipation again of his return. We believe that, we understand that, and so as a result, we are saved, if you will, because of that. But then, at the same time, what we understand, because of Christ living in us and because of the Spirit of God that is in us, one of the things that have been granted to us is wisdom. Yeah, it's, been, it's wisdom. As a matter of fact, do this for me. Before, you go to, before we go to 27, go, go back to chapter 8. Go back to chapter 8. Um, uh, no, 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 chapter 6, actually. No, no, no. I said, I said it right. Go to chapter 8. Go to chapter 8. Let me show you. Let me show you something. In chapter 8, we have what we call, a, a, in a sense, a very, the very personification, uh, whereby wisdom, we know it's, it's a, it's, 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 it comes from God, it, but, but it's personified even in the book of, of Proverbs. In chapter 8, uh, chapter, look at verse 12. And it says, I wisdom dwell with prudence. I find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's wisdom. Pride and arrogance and the evil way. And the perverse mount I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles. All the judges of the earth. I love those who love me. That's wisdom speaking. And those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold. Yes, fine gold. Um, and my revenue than choice silver. Verse 20, I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, and that I may fill their treasures. Verse 22, I always love that verse. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Well, as yet he had not made the earth, watch this, or the fields are the primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. And when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. Then... I was made beside him as the master craft, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. So he gives an admonition. Uh, here again, wisdom is speaking, personified, as though as to say like it's almost like it's a person. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain them. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. So here we have wisdom personified, basically saying to us that as long as God has existed, and of course we know about God, God has no beginning, he has no end. He is an eternal God. He is the self-existent one. So that's why when we read Genesis 1, you know, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So what it's really saying that before there was a beginning as we know it, God already existed. So in reality, God actually began a beginning. But it's the beginning for us as human beings because he's always existed. So, Let's go back now to chapter 27, and of course, the handout that you have, I want you to look at that also uh, while we go through this process. So what it's saying to us, these are things that God would say to us are necessary for our daily life. How do we live from day to day? 
uh, a way of evaluating ourselves, a way of looking at ourselves, and, and way, ways of how we respond to life. How do we look at our own selves? How do we look at others? And, and do we apply the wisdom of God, again, with the ability to live life skillfully, to live life in a way that pleases God, uh, in a way that demonstrates that we are the children of God, that we follow what the instructions of God, and look at, we're going to look at a few things. We might not go through every verse, but there are certain verses that I want to pick up on that will help us to understand uh, what that means. We can actually go with verse 1. He says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. So, uh, underlined, and I already, I've already underlined it for you. Listen, if we weren't, if we weren't uh, doing it this way, I probably would have left that blank so y'all could write it down. Maybe that's what I should have done to kind of get y'all more engaged in it. But here's what we're saying. Make no conclusions about tomorrow since God has not given that guarantee. That's it. God has, God has not told us that we got tomorrow. All we know is that we got today. We know we had yesterday. We know we got today. So, so we will be reminded, uh, and that's one of the things I love about what we're looking at with the other study about the book of Proverbs, is that what we recognize, it actually comes out of the truth. It just comes directly from the very mind of God and what we see, the consistency with what God says. What he says in the Old Testament, he basically says in the New Testament, we, what we figure out about him in the Old Testament, what we recognize about him in the, in the New Testament. So when we look at Proverbs, what we find, some of those very things that we're told in Proverbs are the very things that we're told as Christians, followers of Christ, uh, believers in Jesus Christ, in, in the New Testament. Think about the book of James. James says, come now. You who say tomorrow, James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, if you just want to write it down. James chapter 4, 13 through 17 says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. This is this truth, this truth. I serve on a, a, a board, and, uh, and a lot of times they, 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 when they're giving us messages and the like, and a lot of times on that board they're asking for us to whether, give a yes or no whether or not we can attend meetings or, you know, whatever the, 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 it may be. And, and my response is always, I plan to attend, Lord willing. And I just, that's, just what I, that's just what I write all the time. I plan to attend, Lord willing. Again, it's not, it's not based on Christian. It's just, a, it's just a, a social entity that helps people and doing a wonderful job uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in helping people. Matter of fact, I'll let you know, it's Gulf Coast Community Services Association. Great organization. And that's how I respond. Uh, I plan to attend, Lord willing. And I never should get one time I walk into a meeting and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the persons did ask me, say, what do you mean, Lord willing? And I'm thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? They said, well, you, that's, what, that's, that's always your, your reply. I say, well, here's the reality. I don't know if I got tomorrow. So I can plan for tomorrow, but I know that it only, it's only by the will of God that I can experience tomorrow. So let's always keep that in mind, that whatever it is that we plan to do, let's always include God in that plan and always acknowledging that if we're going to do anything the next moment, the next minute, the next hour, the next day, it's, it's Lord willing. Uh, my grandmother, and, 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 and again, I used, to, I used to love that, I guess as a kid, and I didn't, I didn't really understand it then. But my grandmother used to say that, and, and the response was, watch this, here come my Creole. Don't criticize if it's not good. C'est bon je vais. That was the word. C'est bon je vais. Ooh, ooh, I got it now. In other words, if the Lord will, that's what my grandmother used to say. Uh, we say, hey, my man, see you later. C'est bon je vais. Ooh, I say, now nah, I get it. So we understand that the only way that we can make it through tomorrow is what? By the will of God. Uh, number two says, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Here's the conclusion, here's just, yeah, just a practical way of thinking about that. Let others applaud you, avoid promoting yourself. Listen, you know, one, one of the things that God is, con or we ought to be concerned about is whether or not throughout the day, throughout our conversations with other, 
if our conversation is a lot about I, if it starts with I, if it starts with I, 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 it's worth evaluating because in a very real sense, when we talk about I, we talk about ourselves a lot, indirectly we're bragging, indirectly we're boasting. Yeah, indirectly, we're bringing attention to ourselves. So he says, let another man, let, let other folk talk about how great you are. Let other folk talk about, you know, the kind of person that you are. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, it says, But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. And so regardless, again, what people say about us, if the Lord is not saying the same thing about us that people are saying, it's not legit. <laughs> and, and that's what this proverb, these proverbs are teaching us, that our lives are to line up with the word of God uh, to the point that even in these short, pithy statements, what we're literally reflecting on is just a whole way of living. It's a whole way of life. It's, a, it's major stories, uh, major narratives behind these little short sayings. But God is saying to us, don't, 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 don't praise yourself. Don't, don't, we shouldn't brag on ourselves. We shouldn't be talking about ourselves. Our conversation shouldn't be about ourselves. Um, and sometimes I, I say we can operate in what I call false humility that, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm saying things about myself, and I said, I'm not saying to brag on myself, but in reality, I am bragging on myself, you know? So he would just remind us of that. Uh, I'm, I, I know I said we're not going to do all of them, but y'all know how I love the Word of God. and look like all, every verse is screaming. Say something about me, Lee. See, say something about me. Look at verse 3. A stone is heavy, and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. Wow. Here, here is what I want to encourage. And maybe somebody's stressed out right now. You're going through this pandemic, you know, you've been dealing with this thing for the last literally 12 weeks now. And it's just some stuff that you're looking at some folk and you just want them to change. You're like, why they don't change? Why they don't, why they don't do this, that, and the other? Here's, what a, here's, here's, the, here's a, to look, how to look at that verse. Dealing with foolish folk is one of the most tiresome things you can do. I'm telling you, it's just, it can just be overwhelming when you're dealing with a person who doesn't want to do right. And most of the time when we talk about foolishness, we're talking about most of the time, uh, the Bible would, would remind us in Psalm, it says, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. So what we, we, we equate foolishness with unbelief. Foolishness with unbelief. This is a person who doesn't believe in God. This is a person who doesn't obey God. This is a person who doesn't do the things of God. However, it is an indication that those of us who are believers can sometimes act like we don't believe. So, so what God is saying to us is, is not try to change folk who, who don't know him. Not try to change folk that you've been saying the same thing to them about the last 15 years and you don't see no change. And if that just wearies you, it just makes you, it makes you tired Ask God to give you the strength to just kind of overlook some of the things that they say, some of the things that they do, and go move on to the next thing because it's just too burdensome. First uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he actually says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To try to tell somebody, especially somebody who doesn't know Jesus, what Jesus said, other than to tell them who Jesus is and what Jesus did for them, doesn't make any sense. They can't get it. Look at, look at, uh, uh, let's do this. Let's go to number five now. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. I love that verse. Uh, this, is a, this is a verse that can help us on counseling. Uh, as a matter of fact, look at verse six also. Faith, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Go back. Uh, to verse 5. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. I'm saying it this way. Correcting someone directly with love is better than to think it and say nothing. Here's what, here's what we're talking about. Open rebuke. In other words, that, 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 that somebody, and, and when I say open rebuke, the goal is not to blast somebody publicly. No, it's not to, no. You know, I think all of us know at some point in all of our lives we need correction. 
but we handle correction better when it's just you telling me rather than you telling me in front of a bunch of my partners or in the company of some other people, in the company of some other church members, all right? So he says, open rebuke. To be able to say something, to correct somebody openly, but to do it in a loving manner, not hollering at them, not screaming at them, not cussing, because that's not love that's involved. Uh, I can't do it necessarily uh, when there's wrath involved that I'm mad because that's not demonstrating love either. But if I rebuke a person, if I cor cor correct a person, the Bible says that's better than for me to claim that I love somebody and I see them doing things that are contrary to the word of God, that I know it's, it's, it's against the word of God, but just to think about it and not saying it. No, God say open rebuke is better than love Catholic. Cause see, I, ooh, I love them so much. I love them so much, but I don't want to say it because I don't want to hurt their feelings. How many times we say that? That's not loving a person. If I, if I see someone that's not doing what they ought to be doing, I don't have to, again, I don't have to blast them in public, but, but I should love them enough to be able to say something to that individual. Even though what I may say, it may hurt. Notice again what he says in verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Be a friend who says things to help, even if it hurts, but never pretend to care. Whew, that's important. That's important. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that I know someone is, uh, or you know of me, that I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. But you tell, you know, you're always telling me, man, Lee, I love you, man. You're my bro, man. You're my pastor. You're my, you're my friend. You know, I, man, I love you, man. But you know that my life don't line up with the word of God. To say that you love me, he's literally saying it's almost like the kisses of an enemy that are deceitful. Because you know that kind of love doesn't help me. And so what he's saying, what, he, what he's pointing out is that for, 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 for me to say to you or you to say to me that you love me, but you never correct me, you never help me, rebuke me for something that I ought to be doing that's in accordance with the word of God. He said like that's the kisses of an enemy. Y'all rem remember what happened in the garden, don't you? Remember what happened in the garden? Judas goes up to Jesus to kiss him. And it was the kiss of betrayal. Judas had told the soldiers, hey, whichever one y'all see me kiss, grab him in a hurry. Man, we don't, we don't want no backstabbers in, in our life. And really, I don't want to be a backstabber. So, so to be honest, to know that there's something going on in a person's life and fail to ever correct that individual and claim that I love them, no, no, no. I, I would encourage us to say what needs to be said. Say it lovingly. Even though it may hurt that person, it has the greater potential to help that person than to keep silent or to act as though I care, but I don't care enough to ever tell them anything. Wow. Verse 7, it says, A satisfied soul loads the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul every, th every bitter thing is sweet. In other words, when a person is full, when a person has so much that they're full, you know, I mean, and, and sometimes that can happen with us. You know, you can eat so much. I mean, you're so full of the main course that, that folk will, uh, you know, will person goes out of their way to present a wonderful dessert, and you're like, oh, no, no, I don't want no, I don't, I'm too full. Well, what Solomon is saying is, but notice that, but a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Uh, so that person, again, that's hungry, that person that, that, that has a need, they learn to appreciate even, even the bitter stuff. To, that, to them, that's a good thing. Why? Because they're hungry. Uh, they're starving, if you would. Now, so again, from a spiritual standpoint, what he would help us to say, help us to understand, never be so full of yourself that you become void of appreciating others. Uh, Romans 12, verse 16 actually says this, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise what in your own opinion. Don't be so, don't be so full of yourself like you can't learn nothing. Don't be so full of yourself like can't nobody, 
and nobody as cool as you are and cute as you are and, and handsome as you are and smart as you are. And listen, everybody can learn something. Everybody got room uh, for improvement in some area uh, of our life. So, so he says, don't, don't ever, don't ever be so satisfied that you can't appreciate other things. Yeah. Um, I know sometimes that people are having conversations and, you know, uh, we can be in a group. And a person, a person, you know, they just, they just, they're contributing to the conversation and they just telling us something that they want to share. And sometimes, man, if we're not careful, we can put that on disregard like that person didn't say. Because that sometimes the attitude that I have, I'm so full of myself that really what you have to say cannot contrib- con- does not contribute anything to the growth of this conversation, to whatever we talk, no, learn to appreciate. And we say that sometimes, the little things. And, and to be honest, I don't call them little. I think, I think all of this stuff is a big deal. So, uh, again, just keep that in mind. Verse, uh, verse, let's do verse 10. It says, do not forsake your own friends or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Wow. Do not forsake. Again, uh, don't neglect your own friend or your father's friend. Or go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. So he's breaking it up now. So first of all, he's giving the, the admonition. Um, uh, appreciate your friend. Accept your friend, Right? Uh, then he says, no, go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. When you got adversity, uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go some distance now to get to your brother. However, what he's saying, God has provided you a friend that's right now available. Yeah. So notice, notice again, the, the, what, what comes out of that, a thought. He says, watch, be, watch this, and appreciate the neighbor who is available when family is not. Be the neighbor who is available when family is not, and appreciate the neighbor who is available when family is not. Because what, did you know, this is one of the things I learned about God. God always gives us the answer that we need. God always gives us the help that we need. But sometimes if we don't pay attention to how he's doing it, we can become dissatisfied with him. And watch this, even become angry at our family because they didn't show up like I thought they should have showed up. But the reality is, the next door neighbor, yeah, or the person across the street, or the person at the desk next to me, or, or the person that I went to at Starbucks, God gave me somebody that gave me what I needed to hear, gave me the help that I needed for that moment, but sometimes I fail to appreciate that because it didn't come from the person that I thought it should have come from, Right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember this verse, and maybe you want to go back to it. Some of you will go back to it. Uh, Proverbs uh, 18, verse 24. And we quote this verse. Just want to just give you just a little more insight to that verse. And notice again, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. But watch this. But, but then notice what he said. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So, so watch this. It sounds like there's a positive. It sounds like a positive when you read that first, the first ra- phrase, I'm sorry. The first phrase of Proverbs 18, 24. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But, now remember when Solomon is doing this, he's giving us contrast, right? He's showing us there's, there's a one way that a person can live, but he shows there is a better way. Or he shows there's, a, there's a, a, something that a person shouldn't do. Then he says, but this is what you ought to do. So the contrast is always showing something different than what was previously said because that's what the conjunction but is doing, is giving another way. It's giving a better way. It's giving a more righteous way or it's giving the way that you shouldn't. But, so, but no, so notice in this verse, he is saying, and this is how the Hebrew deter, uh, interprets it. A man who has friends, that word friendly there is a word that literally means come to ruin. In other words, no, and notice, the, notice the, 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 the plural, a man who has friends, plural, more than one, will come to ruin. 
Because the idea there is, if I got a friend, I'm trying to satisfy this one. I try to satisfy that 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 one. And he says, ultimately, I will come to ruin. <laughs> okay? Because it's, it's, it's too many people to juggle. That's what, literally what he's saying. However, but, watch this. There is a friend, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I want to just say this to us. If in any part of your life God gives you one person that you can call on, uh, there's one person that, that you know, I know how we, I think they use that, that language right now, ride or die. I hear people say that. I'm not sure all what that means, but I hear people say it. And it sounds like it means that, hey, man, this is my, this is my best. This is my, this is my best. This is my goodest best, whatever it may be. This is a person that we know we can count on. At the same time, that person knows that they can count on me. So notice what he's saying. He says in that verse, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And so many times when I hear that verse, of course, people go directly to Jesus. In this case, no. He's, talking, he's really talking about a human being, that, that there are human beings that we can count on. So, so, so here's what, what I'm saying, is that we can't ever say God has not given us what we needed. If we got one somebody who cares about us like that, and I know what some folk be saying. Somebody's saying it right now. I don't have nobody. I don't care. I don't have nobody who care about me. That is not the truth. That is, that is just not the truth. Now, here's what I've learned. Sometimes, if it's not the person that I want to care about me, or if it's not the person that I think should care about me, I basically will make the statement that, hey, nobody care about me. But that's not the reality. Folks, remember, God is our Father. God will supply all of our need. But he doesn't always do it the way I think he ought to. But I ought to appreciate the fact that he does. God is not going to leave no child of his alone. That doesn't make sense. That just, that, doesn't, that just doesn't make any sense. How horrible would it be? How horrible would do we, again, uh, how horrible a thing it is, is it for a child to be born and then the parents abandon that child. We know what we think of that person, those persons. That is not a good parent. And so to attribute the fact that God would save us, God would put us in, the fa in his family, and then God would abandon us to say that we don't have nobody. No, no, no. He said there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I just encourage you to pay, pay attention to who that is. In some cases, that friend might be a brother. It might be a sister. It might be a relative. But sometimes that friend may be somebody who is just part of the family of God, the family of Jesus Christ, that y'all don't have no blood ties. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. You do have blood ties because you're tied by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so, but, but there's no biological tie. I'm going to say it that way. There's no natural tie other than the fact that it's a spiritual tie that is attached. So, yeah, if God gives you a friend throughout the, the, the various uh, 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 stages of your life. Um, you know, I guess I th when I think about it in Ville Platte, had a, had a friend named Patrick, and uh, cousin, I guess a cousin that I considered probably my best friend then was Jeffrey, Jeffrey Johnson. That's Larry Johnson's brother. That was, you know, to be honest, I didn't know, I didn't really know Jeffrey was my cousin. I just, I just saw him more as a, as a friend, if you will. Uh, Come to Houston, uh, other people that God gave just as a friend, grow up to be a man. You, you find out that circle is not wide sometimes like we think it is, but God has a way of just kind of narrowing it down and just sort of giving us that person that we know we can count on no matter what. I, I didn't mean to stay there that long, but I thought it was just an important uh, thing to talk about. Um, Let's go, let's go up to uh, verse 15. This is kind of one of them negative ones, but, but you'll get what I'm saying. A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a, and a contentious woman are alike. Oh, wow, Solomon. Really, Solomon? Wow. But we have to know, brother knew what he was talking about. This man was involved with a whole lot of women, so he had sense. And, and then notice what he says in verse 16. Whoever restrains her restrains the wind. And grasp all with his right hand. Now remember, he's giving instructions. He's giving instructions to, to, to young men, primarily. 
and this, this verse would probably be more to be paying attention. Say if you're a single man, pay attention to the woman that you're interested in, that you're talking about dating, possibly want to be your wife, you know, that sort of thing. He says, if she's contentious, notice how he describes it, a continual dripping on a very rainy day. Now, now that, <laughs> think about it. It's, it's raining, and then there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a certain um, area around a house or where you live that you hear, pleak, 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 and you just can't stop it. Like, you know, every, every way, every, everywhere you go, you hear, pleak, pleak. And it just continues. It's raining all day and it just plink, 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 plink. In the morning, it's plink, plink. Noonday, plink, plink. Afternoon, plink, plink. He describes a continual, uh, uh, a contentious woman. Uh, again, this is a woman who want to brawl. She want to fight. She basically want to argue. The Lord is saying, Solomon will give wisdom. And, 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 I'm, and, I, and I did it from a standpoint, almost a, to a degree, just to give it not only for women, but generally speaking about people. Don't be a person others dread being around or view as impossible to deal with. Listen, well, if you done had three or four people tell you, man, you hard to deal with. Man, you hard to get along with. You know they're telling the truth. They just telling the truth. You just got to believe what they said is the truth. So Solomon is saying, he's saying, fellas, if she already want to brawl with you while y'all dating, he's telling you, if you get married, expect her to be a brawler. Yes, I'm just telling you the truth. Young ladies, if you you talking about dating a man, and, and, and everything you say, he want to do something different. You want to pick this restaurant, he want to pick this other one. You want to go to this movie, he want to go somewhere else. And pretty much, he's getting his way. I'm just, Solomon is saying, be careful. If you marry him, if you decide this is going to be your, your mate for life, <laughs> Solomon is, is saying, it's going to be just like, just like how on a rainy day, and all you get is bleep, 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 bleep. Rain is just falling and the dripping and they're just driving you crazy in the head. Just again, some wisdom that, he, that he's giving. We're about to wrap it up. We're about to, about to wrap it up. Y'all can tell I'm having fun with this right now, right? Practical ways of living. Practical ways of living. Um, uh, this is one of the great ones in verse 17. He says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sh- sharpens the continents." Of, a, of his friend, as iron sharpens iron. This is the idea again of, you know, just if it's filing it or whatever, in those days, they would take one piece of iron, another piece of iron, and they would just, just move it against each other. They would take a hammer and, and just, and until that, whatever that instrument was that was supposed to be sharp, if you will, it would sharpen it. And, 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 and as a result of where it's being hit, you know, if that was rust on it, it would start to get a little brighter and it, and, and it would start to change. If it was dull, it would start to sharpen out, if you will. So what God is saying is that the mutual relationships that we have with each other, we ought to actually be helping others to become better. That's really what ought to happen. If, if, if in, you're in a relationship that is just so one-sided, that, that everything about the relationship is you, everything about the relationship is what you want in it, more than likely that other person is not being helped. Or if it's the other side, that you're in a relationship and the person that you're with, they're always getting what they want every time. But they, that, that relationship. But when there is a mutual exchange of ideas and concerns and, and passions and emotions and intellect and education, when, when there's a mutual uh, sharing, if you would, he says, he says what happens now is both lives are enhanced as a result. Oh, yeah. You both become better because why? You, you've got something to offer that the other person doesn't. That person has something that, that you don't have. And so iron, watch this, sharpens iron. Um, Romans 15 verse 14 actually says this. Paul says, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, 
that you are all full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And that's what he's talking about with us as Christians. There ought to be a mutual um, um, uh, thought that we have, a mutual desire we have, uh, a mutual function that we have to make others better. We want to see everybody better. And we ought to see that everybody potentially can make me better. So he says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man uh, sharpens the countenance of his, uh, his friend. Um, verse um, 19. As in water reflects face, as in water reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. Watch this. Who you are inwardly is really who you are. In other words, uh, what's really happening in your mind, the way we think. So a man thinks, so is he. If, if, I, if I think pure, then God is saying I'm pure. If I think evil, or I'm sorry, if I think if I think um, um, arrogantly towards somebody, that I'm better than somebody, if that's what I'm thinking, then God says that's who I am. So inwardly, who I am in terms of my character, in terms of, in terms of how I think, in terms of how I process things, how, in terms of how I look at a person, in terms of how I look at situations, in terms of, of watch this, I, the Bible even says this, out of the abundance of the heart, whatever is in the heart of my mind, that's what I'm going to say. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know. On every Sunday, you know, we used to gather, uh, y'all know that, all of those years we gathered. On every Sunday, you know, for an hour and a half, two hours in our case, you know, we can all kind of keep it together, you know, for the most part. I think most of us did that, you know. But whatever is really in my heart, that's what's going to come out. And whoever I really, that's what's going to show up. Do, do you know some people, do you know some people who are kind? I mean, they're just kind. And it doesn't matter what the situation is, they're kind. And, and they don't brawl, they don't get angry, they don't, they don't argue. And, you know, sometimes as Christians, we actually put those people down. And, and here's the kind of the stuff we'll say. Don't be letting them run over you. I'm just being kind. Yeah, just being, that's it. Just being kind. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure where it comes from. I think it's just about it, just a habit. You know, I'm, when I'm out doing my yard and stuff like that, I wave everybody that pass by. My hand is on my lawnmower, but if I see them, I'm going to take my, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait. Everybody. It doesn't matter who they are. I don't, I don't recognize the vehicle. I don't know the person. All I'm saying is whatever is in us is what's going to come out of us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, listen, I'm learning something, that when people are mean before they get sick, mm -hmm, they mean when they're sick. <laughs> oh, yeah, when people are kind before they get sick. And let me tell you, let me tell you where I learned that, and I'll, and I'll be closing. Um, uh, years ago, some of you all remember Preston Williams. Uh, Preston uh, was, uh, was the brother of uh, Velma and Thelma. And uh, uh, Preston, I guess he, during the time Reverend Wilson was a member here, and then he moved from California, came to Houston, and Preston was sick, and he wound up in the hospital. And I would, I never forget that. They were saying that something hap happened, that, that Preston's mind was altered and the whole, whole nine yards. Go to visit uh, Preston at Veterans Hospital and walk in that, in that, uh, in his room. And it didn't matter how much pain he was in, no matter what he was dealing with, oh, I, I say pain, no matter what, how the doctors had diagnosed whatever he was going through, when you would walk in that room, this guy would have a great smile on his face, and, and it didn't matter what the doctors were saying, and you say, Preston, how you doing? And he would, every time, fine, big smile on his face, and I'm saying, oh my God, how can this man have all of these things that are going on with him, and he's talking about, I'm fine. Just a big smile on his face. But you know what? I learned something. That's how Preston was before he got sick. That's how he was before the, uh, the, the trials of life took over. That's how he got before he was overwhelmed by various illnesses and the like. And so what I'm saying, whoever we are on the inside is ultimately what's going to come out uh, on the outside of us. Um, finally, 
Look at, at verse 21, and I'm going to be done for the day. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. Wow. The, f- the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. So again, here's just the thought behind it. Be a person with qualities other people admire. Be a person with qualities other people admire. Peter talked about that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may, watch this, by your good works, which they observe, do what? Glorify God in the day of visitation. Wow, that is just, that's just awesome. Peter's talking about people who were going through a tough time. Uh, they, were, they, they had their own pandemic, if you would, and, it, and that pandemic was the persecution that they were experiencing all over the world for being followers of Jesus Christ. And, but Peter is saying, he said, I beg you, sojourners and abstain from fleshly lust. Again, those, those are the things that he's talking about as far as uh, wanting to satisfy myself, want to satisfy my flesh. He says, you got to abstain from that. We got we to gotta, we gotta war against that. And I'm, I'm battling that right now with this, you know, with my weight and all that kind of stuff. I'm really struggling right now just not to satisfy my flesh. But he, but he yeah, I, I identifies it is a struggle, right? He says, having your conduct honorable among Gentiles. In other words, regardless of what's going on, God is saying there's a certain quality that you and I ought to maintain. We ought not be doing what the world is doing. Um, thank God we're not, we weren't the ones that were hoarding all the stuff. Thank God right now. We're not the ones complaining about over and over what the government is doing. We're not the ones complaining about, uh, I don't like this going on and that. No, no, no. We're allowing who we are just to show up where we are and to live it out in such a way that people will look at us, people that don't even know us, people that don't even know Jesus, people that don't even care about God, will see that we're different than that of the world. That's who we are, folk. And that's what Solomon is calling for. The refining pot is for silver, meaning that when you put silver pure silver, when you put pure gold in the refining pot, you heat it up, and the dross that's on top, the the, the ugly stuff, you know, the dirt, the grind, that's on the outside, when it's put, the heat is put to it, 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 it melts off the ugly stuff, and at the end of the day, the only thing that stands is the silver and the gold. Why? Because it cannot It cannot, he can't burn it up, if you will. Because the refiner knows what to do with it. So he says, and a man is valued by what others say of him. Yeah, yeah. What are others saying? What kind of of legacy are we leaving as the Christian church in 2020? What kind of legacy are we leaving in the midst of these three months of the COVID-19, what kind of legacy are we leaving throughout this year when, 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 when the world will reflect on us and when we will reflect on what happened during these, these months that we're having to deal with this, this dreaded disease? What was our attitude? What was our character? What, would, what did we demonstrate? What will people say at our funeral? What will be written on our in our obituary. What is my neighbor saying about me right now? What, what is the neighbor upstairs or what is the neighbor downstairs saying? What are my friends going to say when we go back to work? What are my coworkers going to say when we go back to work? When, we, when, we, when, we, when we're able to assimilate and come back together? When we, when we return to the church, is the, are people going to see a person with a different attitude? Or am I going to have the same attitude that I had before? Especially if it was some stanky thinking. I mean, I'm going to stop. Stinky thinking going on. What am I leaving behind? What do people know about me? What are they saying about me? And I'm closing. I, ne- I never shall forget, never shall forget. And it's a, it's a sermon that will, will, forever, will forever remain in me. My, uh, my uncle, uh, Alan, Alan, Alan Skinner, 
uh, in the uh, Night Baptist Church in the Bill Platt community had a, had a wonderful reputation. People knew him a certain kind of way. Yeah, there are certain things they would say. I didn't believe whatever, but, you know, I mean, he was a human being too. I mean, so he wasn't perfect, however. But I never shall forget the, uh, the sermon that uh, my, my, my former pastor, who's with the Lord now, Dr. M. L. Thomas, preached. And it was the sermon about David, you know, David's relationship with Saul and how David and Saul had built such a wonderful relationship that David said that his love for Saul, I'm, I'm sorry, for Jonathan, Jonathan, I'm sorry, his love for Jonathan surpassed the love of women. There wasn't nothing sexual about it. That was nothing homosexual. That was nothing immoral. He was just saying that's how much he loved Jonathan uh, because of this relationship that they had built. Jonathan was the king to be, but Jonathan submitted himself to David to the point that his submission caused his father to even hate him. His father even tried to kill him uh, because of his loyalty to David. And so, um, you know, there's a day that they were trying to figure out how Saul really felt about it. Did John, I mean, did David need to leave? Came up with the plan, and uh, they made the determination. It was time for, for David to go. And Jonathan made this statement. He says, tomorrow is the new moon. He says, and your seat will be empty and you will be missed. Oh, tomorrow is the new moon. and Your seat will be empty and you will be missed. I'm just asking us. What kind of legacy are we leaving right now? What, what will be said about us? What will be said about the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of this issue that we are dealing with because God has us in this for such a time as this? What will be said about us? And then more personally, what will be said about you? Because the record will show. And it will show either in this life or it will show up at the Bema seat of Christ. Make up your mind. So I hope and trust that, uh, Good Shepherd, that since we've gone through this study uh, of the book of Proverbs, there's some things that we've been able to gain, some insights that we've been able to, some things that we never even thought about. But it's about, watch, watch this, practical ways of living on a daily basis that ultimately brings glory to God. Uh, I will be on again tonight at 7, for those of you that will. But it's going to only be about a conference call. Uh, so I look forward to it. And for those of you that will, just be back on. I'm excited about it. Probably look at some verses that I didn't look at uh, uh, today. Uh, keep praying for Luana. Keep praising God for Linton. Keep loving each other, taking care of one another. Remember we said no Sunday school this coming Sunday. But I am asking us to recommit ourselves, rededicate ourselves. For those of you that weren't a part of Sunday school, to become a part of Sunday school. We're going to start again, resuming the first Sunday in June. Right now, we are having conversations in terms of how we're going to reopen, if we're going to reopen, and if we do reopen, how we're going to do it, to do it safely, to still uh, recognize that we have to honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. We're still keeping that in mind in terms of going forward. Um, and so we will let, give, be giving you some more in, uh, directions about that, more information about that, uh, more insight to that uh, in the next coming week. Until we meet again. Father, love you. Thank you so much just for this opportunity to be able to serve in this capacity. I pray that as we move forward, all glory, honor, and praise continues to be yours, that you're exalted in every way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For those of you that uh, would like the souvenir book, they're still available. Remember, $65, we said, as a contribution to your church for the 60th anniversary. We're still keeping that in mind. Those books are available. Just call the office. If you want one, Jew, you will get it to you by mail. Uh, but we are saying just to give, give, give the money, if you will, that, it, that is uh, a design designated for the souvenir book. And we'll be happy uh, to, uh, to get it to you. So a good way to stay connected, get to know still, look at everybody again. Uh, use that book to be able to do that. I love you all, Good Shepherd. And I look forward to continuing to serve you in this capacity and anticipating the day when God allows us all to come back together again. Until then, God bless you. Bye-bye.